Imposter phenomenon is quite strong among perfectionists. You look around and see people who are doing so much better than you or how you think are doing so much better than you and you think inside, I have to prove every day I'm good enough. Now for some people, perfection or perfectionism is a trait to strive for. For most of us, if you listen to this podcast, you're probably vaguely familiar with the personal development world and you probably know that perfectionism is actually not a very good thing and tends to hold us back in life more than it actually helps us. And so today's episode is very exciting because I'm joined by Thomas Curran, who's actually an assistant professor at the London School of Economics. And Thomas has recently written a book called The Perfection Trap, The Power of Good Enough in a World That Always Wants More. Success is a bottomless pit. It depletes us in its pursuit. And just like the horizon, it keeps slipping away the further we get to it. This is how perfectionism operates within the mindset of people. And so, of course, you know, when things don't go well, we're going to turn on ourselves because we weren't perfect in that moment. He has written for the Harvard Business Review. He was featured in New Scientist and his work has been covered in all sorts of publications, including The Guardian and The Telegraph and The Wall Street Journal. He kind of talks about what we as individuals can do once we know that perfectionism is kind of bad to resist the trappings of society that encourages us to constantly strive for more and strive to constantly be perfect. You are a human being, you exist, so you are enough. And I think that's the most important lesson to take through life, something to remember all the time when things go well, when things don't go quite so well. It's okay, you're human, we fail, you are enough. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for uh, having me. You are the author of this fantastic book, The Perfection Trap. And in this episode, I thought we'd talk about all things perfectionism. Great. So I wonder if we can get started with uh, a definition. So what is perfectionism? So perfectionism is really a uh, worldview, I suppose, the, the way we see and interpret the world and our interactions with other people. Um, a lot of people think that it's a very active, optimistic, high striving, uh, excessively um, uh, high goals and standards that we hold for ourselves. But actually, that's only part of the story because perfectionists do have excessive standards, but it comes from a place of deficit. So it comes from this place where I'm not good enough, I'm not perfect enough, and therefore I must have these high standards for myself to prove to other people that I'm worth something, that I'm perfect, that I'm flawless. Um, and so really, for me, if you want to get at the nub of perfectionism, it's really about that deficit thinking. Oh, interesting. Um, and one of the things you say in the book is about how we've misunderstood the root cause of perfectionism. I wonder if you can you can talk a little about that or what have we misunderstood about what causes perfectionism? I think the main thing is around where it comes from. And I think a lot of us think that this is kind of a hardwired personality trait that we're kind of born with or that we just possess um, and that there's very little that we could do about it. It's kind of part of our psychology. And what I tried to do in the book is is kind of probe that a little bit and look at the data. And we know that about 30 to 40% of perfectionism is genetics, that's to say heritage. So very little we can do about it. We're kind of just born of it. But 30 to 40 percent leaves a lot for the environment to explain. And my, I guess, uh, exploration of perfectionism is a cultural trait and a uh, something that's kind of socially learned has has taught me that there are many factors outside of us that kind of weigh on our need to be perfect, weigh on that deficit thinking. The world around us radiates perfection. The world around us te tells us that there's always more to do. There's always bigger, better. We can be fitter, stronger, more attractive. And as a consequence, it isn't only a genetic psychology, psychological personality trait, but it also has uh, a very strong cultural influence. And that's why in the book I've described it as a cultural phenomenon. Mm. So how how do we measure perfectionism? And I guess I, I'm kind of asking in two senses. Firstly, in the studies, how is perfectionism measured? And secondly, how would someone listening or watching this, like how, how might I identify whether I'm struggling with perfectionism, for example? So as academics like to measure things, and what we've done over many decades is listen to perfectionistic people tell us what perfectionism is, what are the main characteristics, what are the main thought processes, what are the main behaviors. And we kind of condensed all that information into a set of items that we can measure perfectionism uh, on a scale. So you can say, I strive to be perfect, for instance. And how much do you agree with that statement? Some people might agree a lot. Some people might disagree. Some people are kind of in the middle. And so 
in order to take a metric or a measure of perfectionism, we kind of ask a string of these kind of questions. We aggregate them and we see where people sit on that spectrum. And that's kind of typical to most personality traits. So it isn't just perfectionism measured like that, conscientiousness, extroversion, neuroticism, all of these big personality traits are all measured in the same way. And that's one of the reasons, again, why I talk about in the book, perfectionism is not kind of a black or white. It's not, I am a perfectionist or you aren't a perfectionist, but it's really, you know, where we sit on the perfectionism spectrum. And some of us will be more perfectionistic on that spectrum. Some will be a little less. Most will be uh, in the middle. And the big contribution, I think, of my work, and also I've updated this data for the book, is showing that that middle bit of the perfectionist spectrum, where most of us sit, is slowly creeping upwards. And we're seeing growing levels of perfectionism over time, particularly among young people. So that's how we measure it. Oh, okay. Why is perfectionism bad or potentially bad? <laughs> <laughs> perfectionism is is bad uh, because of this this idea that there's there's very it, it's rooted in deficit, and a lot of the traits that it's confused with things like meticulousness, conscientiousness, diligence, perseverance, all of these are great things, but they're not perfectionism. These things include high standards, and they include striving for really good results in what we do but then don't come from a place of deficit. And that's what differentiates those things from perfectionism. Perfectionism very much comes from, I'm not good enough, I'm not perfect enough, and I have to prove to myself and other people that I am. Um, and when you start there, you can begin to unpack why perfectionism can be really damaging. So think about it. It comes from a place of deficit. It's a sense that I must move through the world proving to other people that I'm good enough. So in order to do that, I must excel. I must be perfect. I must have high standards, okay? But what we're doing is we're setting ourselves up for failure because those excessive standards are too high. So what we find ourselves in situations where we're not meeting those standards, we feel like we're failing, we feel like we're looking like a failure to other people, so we feel anxious, our self-esteem plummets, and in order to overcome those feelings and sort of overcompensate, we strive for even higher standards, which means we fail more, which means we feel more anxious, more lower self-esteem, self and you can begin to see how perfectionism really starts to uh, become a negative downward spiral that gets entrenched and, and accelerates the more we overcompensate and the more we encounter setbacks and failures. So, so that's why perfectionism is particularly damaging because it triggers this spiral of self-defeat uh, that can be really difficult for people. Mm, okay. So, uh, um, so would I be right in saying that the difference between healthy striving and unhealthy perfectionism is what the root cause is? Exactly. And we're saying that the root cause is a sense of deficit, a sense of I am not enough, therefore I must strive for more Absolutely. in the unhealthy category. Absolutely. And it, and that's the that's the difference between perfectionism and these other traits, right? Because these other traits come from a very active, optimistic sense of I want to improve, I want to get better, I, I want to do the best I can do, but importantly, I can let things go. So if I don't quite make that high standard, I'm able to take what's there to be learned and move forward. Unfortunately, perfectionists have a real difficulty in accepting that sometimes we just don't improve or sometimes we go sideways or sometimes we even regress and those things are really catastrophic for the perfectionist because it's really difficult for them to reconcile those feelings without over generalizing them to the self right there must be something wrong with me i haven't succeeded in this case so therefore i'm flawed mm. and i'm irredeemable you know i'm i'm kind of you know there's kind of a very self-critical self-loathing mindset that so that's the creep in for the perfectionist so that's the that's the core difference mm. Yeah, it, re it reminds me of uh, a few friends I had at university who, you know, the way they would approach studying for exams is a constant striving to avoid failure. Because, you know, in medical school, the whole like, oh, if I fail, I, you know, I, you know, I was right about myself. I knew I, di I didn't belong in Cambridge Medical School. I knew that I, I you know, I, I knew I wasn't good enough to be a doctor and this is proof. Therefore, I must strive to not fail. And then other, and then other of my friends including me, we'd kind of t t treat it as a bit of a game, a bit of a competition. It's like, oh, you know, it's like, it's like playing a board game with friends. It's like, oh, you know, what do you, what'd you get on that exam? But for those people who were like the anti-failure mode, asking, uh, asking that question of what did you get on, on that exam was like, oh my God, like, you know, let's not talk about it. It's the worst yeah. thing ever. Like, yeah. does that vibe with your experience of perfectionism? <sighs> Absolutely. And I see it all the time in universities. There's so many students have a lot of trouble these days accepting that they might not 
get as good a grade as they thought they were going to get. And they're really averse to even the slightest bit of critical feedback. So we have to be really careful. And I think that's really the indicative of this kind of perfectionism that's beginning to take over among young people where they're really fearing the consequences of failures because they're told failures can be catastrophic, particularly like for your future life chances. So of course they kind of develop this need to excel at all times. And even like, uh, even a, objectively high grade can feel disappointing to the perfectionist uh, because as I say, it's this kind of idea that it's never quite enough. The better I'm do, the, be the better I do, the better I'm expected to do. And there's always this kind of churning of high and excessive expectations that is really difficult to reconcile with reality. Yeah. So you said earlier that um, perfectionism is about 30 to 40% genetic. Uh, what, what does that mean and how do we know? Okay, so about 30 to 40% of perfectionism is genetic. And we know that because classic twin studies where we compare identical, non-identical twins uh, against adopted siblings, and we look at the similarities in their traits, about 30 to 40% of personality and self-oriented and socially prescribed perfectionism, these are aspects of perfectionism that are measured in these studies, uh, are genetically herited. That's to say that they come from factors to do with genes. Um, but as I, as I mentioned earlier, that still leaves a lot for the environment to explain. So perfectionism is very much uh, a nature, but it's also, there's a lot of nurture in there too. Mm. And what other personality traits does perfectionism tend to correlate with? So it correlates very strongly with neuroticism. Uh, so perfectionists tend to be highly neurotic. There is a correlation. Oh, sorry, what is neuroticism for people who might not be familiar with? Neurot term? Neuroticism is a personality trait, uh, which essentially is rooted in anxiety. Uh, it's a sense of worry and rumination about how we, um, or how we're doing or how we're appearing relative to other people. And, and people who are, who are neurotic tend to be very uh, unsettled, irritable, anxious. Uh, so we see very high correlation between perfectionism and neuroticism. But there's also interest Interestingly, a correlation between perfectionism and conscientiousness, which is a, which is a, a sort of rooted in very hard work, diligence, perseverance to tasks. Um, so there's this kind of really yin and yang, I suppose, with perfectionism when it comes to other personality traits. There's some really good things that it correlates with, but it can also correlate with really negative things. And so this this is why perfection is such a fascinating uh, personality trait because it has these kind of two sides, uh, which make it really interesting. And are there any group differences like gender or sex differences, race differences even between how perfectionism plays out amongst like large groups of people? Yeah, it's a really good question. And it's one I find really ch challenging to answer because the research that I've done has looked at over 40,000 young people. And um, let's take gender differences first because a lot of people would think, you know, this is something that's perhaps a little bit higher in, in uh, women than it is in men. Um, but the data doesn't seem to bear that out. And that's really surprising for us and it's surprising for other people that I talk to. So when we take these 40,000 people and we try to explain levels of perfectionism based on the number of females in a sample, we don't find anything. There's no difference. And so that's really fascinating that men and women tend to score relatively similar on aspects of perfectionism. Now, that's not to say that women aren't exposed to environments that trigger perfectionism into a greater degree. That's not to say that the society we live in still has um, impossible or expectations or puts high and excessive expectations on women more so than it does in men. I think we can have that discussion and I think that would, there would be a lot of validity to that claim. However, in terms of levels, we don't see a great deal of difference. To your uh, ethnicity question, we just don't have the data, sadly. But I, we do have some data that show some interesting cross-cultural differences for perfectionism. So in individualistic cultures, we tend to see perfectionism and this kind of self-perfectionism that comes from within, this kind of sense that I need to be perfect, uh, tends to be quite high, a very dominant aspect of perfectionism. Where in more collectivistic cultures, we tend to see perfectionism, this kind of social element of perfection, a kind of sense that everybody around me expects me to be perfect, where well, it tends to be quite dominant and quite high. So there's some interesting cultural differences in how perfectionism expresses. Um, but gender is the one that we were surprised by and we don't really find anything there. Okay, interesting. Um, so two points on that. Firstly, on the gender one, that, that surprises me because, again, I, I could be wrong about this, but I thought that neuroticism and conscientiousness are both slightly skewed towards female. And therefore, if perfectionism correlates with those 
at least also anecdotally like most of the people i know who would identify as perfectionists tend to tend to be girls <laughs> but like yeah i guess you guys have looked at forty thousand people worth of worth of data do you know yeah. what we, we it surprised us too it's it's one of those things where you know our data set is probably the biggest perfectionism data set uh that we we have um and you know when we threw that variable into our regression model we were expecting to see something and it's it's really striking that we didn't yeah. you know these aren't perfect correlations they probably share about 25 to 30 percent of variance which is quite strong for you know psychological variables but it certainly by no means is there complete overlap between these personality traits so it doesn't necessarily uh it doesn't necessarily correlate suggest if one correlate with the other that they would also have higher higher mean levels in the aggregate but yeah we were surprised by that and it's one of those findings that we're still we're still looking at trying to figure out you know what's happening there but as i say i think there are contextual factors that that make uh women a lot more vulnerable to the impacts of perfectionism but mean levels not so much mm. I, will, I want to put a quick bookmark in that contextual factors i think it would be it would be, it would be definitely good to talk about that yeah on on the cultural front front so you said kind of individualistic versus collectivist cultures which generally means sort of like west versus east mm. i in a sort of broad brushstroke yeah so I, I, would it would it be fair to say that, for example, like for, for example, I know a lot of people who are perfectionistic who are from like India, Pakistan, kind of I'm from Pakistan, yeah. or my you know mates from like whose families are Chinese. There's this whole vibe of like a kind of the Asian parent uh, kind of phenotype of Asian parent, Asian families expects the the child to be very very good at the thing. Mm. But then if I think of like my white friends. They tend not to have the family expectation, and yet they still struggle with perfectionism. Yeah. So, is that what you're, you're kind of what you're getting at <laughs> with this sort of in a collectivist versus individualistic kind of vibe? That's exactly what we're getting at there. There's a kind of an interdependency uh, in collectivistic cultures, whereby a lot of the community and people around individuals support push maybe uh, and that can impact on people's psychology that's not quite strong in individualistic cultures but what is a bit stronger is this kind of sense that it's up to you and only you to make something of yourself yeah. anything of yourself right so there's this kind of this kind of self-perfectionism really comes through a lot stronger in that kind of culture because it's really on the individual and i think that's what's happening here with those differences got it so we mentioned, um, you know, when it comes to the gender differences, there are cultural or societal factors that maybe affect some groups differently to others. Do you have a sense of what those what those are? Okay, that's a really big question to unpack. In the book, I try to pinpoint several different areas of life uh, where perfectionism is really uh, dominant, or where perfectionism is accentuated, lionized um kind of amplified uh, and those 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 core factors are within consumer culture and this kind of idea that we 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 hell perpetually in a sense of deficit because you know that's what helps us consume and work and keeps the economy spinning on its axis uh social media which kind of takes that kind of model and, and puts it into a social platform where we're the content creators that create this kind of aura of discontent where targeted ads can thrive uh, i talk about uh schools and colleges and how it's really really uh t tough right now for young people to excel in school and college because competition is so fierce and they need to be so much better uh than their contemporaries just to get into the elite colleges which allow them access to the elite jobs uh, and then of course the workplace itself it's a really insecure workplace right now for young people it's completely changed from when our parents were at work it's all about the hustle all about the grind it's all about the individual and that can also uh, perpetuate a sense of perfectionism now within those those key things of course there's going to be certain subgroups that are much more exposed than others that's not to say that you know that uh, they have it easier because i think everybody in this world is exposed to a lot of pressure these days so i have to be clear there but certainly uh, i would say that there is a lot of expectation on on young women particularly when we look at things like social media and the world of advertising to kind of look and appear a certain way to hold a certain um, personality uh, speak and behave in certain ways which i think men sometimes get a bit of a pass on so i think there is 
uh, definitely expectations of women that are greater than in men in some certain areas, particularly when it comes to image and appearance. And that still is the case. Um, and also some subgroups of people, you know, people from uh, lower down the social class um, hierarchy, you know, they have to lift themselves much further and f than other people. And they start from way back. And that can create a sense of and a need to excel and overachieve in order to clear those structural hurdles. Uh, and of course, there's also uh, still racial prejudices, discrimination that we see in society and people from marginalized backgrounds and underrepresented backgrounds also have a really tough time kind of pushing through those structural boundaries. So it's not just about class, but it's also about ethnic background where, you know, that can also weigh on uh, their sense that they need to do so much better than other people just to stay in the same place. Mm. Uh, and so those are, those are you know, it, it was a big question to unpack, but I hope I was able to kind of give you a good roadmap. There. Yeah, no, that's a good roadmap. And we'll put a link to the book um, and, and your website and everything else down in the show notes and the video description, wherever people happen to be watching or listening to this, if they want to explore those areas more. Yeah. Um, is there any data around uh, sort of adverse childhood experiences uh, when you mentioned the perfectionism stuff, it reminded me of some stuff that I've read around uh, kids who feel uh, sort of abandoned by their parents when they were younger and can often end up becoming perfectionist -y and like they're, oh, okay, cool. I guess mummy doesn't love me unless I do well in my exam. Therefore, let me continue to do well in my exams. Is that is that a, is that a thing that, that the data shows as well? Yeah, so Ali, I've got to be a bit careful here because I'm not a clinical psychologist. Um, so going into areas of sort of trauma and early life uh, experiences is not my area. However, what I will say is I've studied a lot of clinical work in perfectionism and we know that there is a strong correlation between early life trauma and uh, later life perfectionism. And one of the big things there is this kind of sense of abandonment, this kind of sense that I, was, I wasn't enough to be approved of to, to to be loved essentially and as a consequence that's carried through into older older adulthood where we never really feel like um we uh, are good enough we never really feel like we deserve other people's love and approval and as a consequence we overcompensate we tend to be very anxious and this is why there can be some significant you know mental health problems that are associated with perfectionism that's rooted in that early life distress but I would say that that's probably a discussion for a clinical psychologist rather than me as a social psychologist. Um, but the but the point is definitely valid, and there is a definite role for early life experiences in later life perfectionism. Nice. Um, we talked earlier about how perfectionism is kind of on a spectrum um, or like a, a scale, and it's not it's not black or white. Um, and in the book, you talk about your grandfather as an example of potentially like healthy striving rather than perfectionism. I wonder if you can tell that story because I think it, it's quite illustrative. Yes, yeah, so my grandfather of another era, and I think this also is an important factor in this conversation because uh, I think my my grandfather would have a little bit of perfectionism if he came through today, but he came through in, a, in an era where there wasn't such demands, there wasn't five-star reviews and everybody's providing feedback on your work. He was a carpenter, by the way. So now he would, of course, have a My Builder profile and everybody would be reviewing his work and it would be really a lot more uh, pressurized than I guess it was in his day. However, I used to love going to watch my grandfather build things. He was a master craftsman. He really had an eye for detail and he created some just, you know, from the vantage point of a child, some amazing things. And I think what's really, what I remember most about my grandfather is that, you know, he didn't have this kind of hang up that I have about, well, is it good enough? Can I send it out into the world? He just made everyday things that people needed. And he delivered those things to their new homes, didn't loiter for validation or a five star review or a fire emoji. <laughs> he just kind of left them there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that was, and it was his vocation, right? Like that was his role. He just wanted to leave everyday things in the world for other people to use. And that is an extremely different way to move about life, to, to go about your working and professional life than the way that perfectionists like me go about it, which is essentially, oh goodness, I hope people like it. I hope they give it a good review. I hope they're not going to criticize me or find what I'm saying, um, you know, uh, upsetting or whatever you know because these are the doubts that us perfectionists harbor all the time my grandfather had no such hang-ups he wanted to do well and he wanted to prove to other people of course that he was a good craftsman but if he didn't do things perfectly if he left a bit of varnish 
or, you know, left a little screw just jutting imperceptibly above the woods. He'd let those mistakes wash through him as mm. sure a sign of his fallibility as his wrinkles or sci sciatica. And I think that's, for me, that's what differentiates a, a conscientious a, a, um, a, a striver or a conscientious person from a perfectionistic person. This episode is very kindly brought to you by Huel. I've been a paying customer of Huel since my fifth year of medical school, since 2017. Actually, since before I started my YouTube channel. And I first started using Huel because my life was pretty hectic. I was juggling lots of different things, like medical school and exams, and trying to sort out publication points for my future, like, doctor job applications. And alongside, I was running a business, I was building an app, and I was trying to maintain some semblance of a social life. And so Huel actually came in really handy for that. If you haven't heard of it, it's basically a meal in a shake that contains all of the ingredients that are essential to thrive. It's got a perfect balance of protein and carbs and fats and vitamins and minerals. And these days, the Huel Black Edition is my absolute favorite. It comes in nine flavors. Salted caramel is my personal favorite. And the Huel Black Edition is particularly good because it is a higher protein version than the Huel Original. It was the original that I was using back in 2017, but the Black Edition came out a few years ago. Changed the game because it's 40 grams of protein for 400 calories. I'm trying to get hench, and so I'm keeping an eye on like my protein intake. And it's so nice that I can get that high protein hit as the first thing in the morning. Huel is also very affordable. It comes out to £1.68 per meal for a 400 calorie meal, which is actually way cheaper than most of the other options on the market and certainly way cheaper than other, you know, even standalone protein shakes. Like I said, I've been a paying customer of Huel since 2017. My friends literally make fun of me as to how much Huel I have in the house. And they're like, what? You have all this Huel? I'm like, yeah, it's actually so good. So if you're interested in signing up for Huel, then head over to huel.com forward slash deep dive. And if you use that URL, A, it helps us out because then they're keen to sponsor more episodes. Episodes, but B, you get a completely free t-shirt and a free shaker with your order. So that is hopefully an incentive to use Huel.com forward slash deep dive. And actually, I interviewed the founder of Huel, Julian Hearn, on this very podcast in the very first season. So you can check out that episode if you like. It's got rave reviews, really good episode, all about starting and growing a business. So anyway, thank you so much, Huel, for sponsoring this episode. This episode is very kindly brought to you by Trading212. Now, people ask me all the time for advice about investing because I've made a bunch of videos about it on the YouTube channel. And my advice for most people is generally invest in broad stock market index funds, which is exactly what you can do completely for free with Trading212. It's a great app that lets you trade stocks and funds and ETFs and foreign exchange if you really want to. And one of the great things about the app is that if you're new to the world of investing, you can actually invest with fake money. You don't have to put real money in. They've got a practice mode where you invest fake money and then it actually tracks what the market is doing in real time. So you can see, had I invested £100 into this thing, what would my return have been? X weeks or X months further down the line. Once you've got some comfort with that, then it's super easy to deposit money into your Trading212 account. You can use Apple Pay, like I do initially, or you can use a direct bank transfer. And then once the money is in your Trading212 account, then you can invest it in basically whatever you want. Now, if you're based in the UK, you might be familiar with the concept of an ISA, which is an individual savings account, which is basically a tax-free wrapper that you can put money in. You can put £20,000 in every year, up to £20,000, and it resets every April, and then all that money can grow, and it's completely tax-free for the rest of your life. And if you want to sign up for an ISA, you can sign up for one completely for free, also on Trading212. So if you haven't yet filled up your ISA allowance, or at least put some money into your ISA for this year, that might be a good step forward. Also, very excitingly, there's a new feature that they've added to the app, which is a daily interest on your uninvested cash. These interest rates may go up or down over time as the economic environment changes, but the cool thing is that you get paid out every single day if you're into that sort of thing. The app also lets you auto-invest, which is a great thing because then you can automatically invest a percentage of your paycheck into the thing every month. And so if you haven't yet started with investing and you want to give it a go, then you can download the app on the App Store and if you use the coupon code ALI, A -L -I, that will give you a totally free share worth up to £100. It's available on iPhone and Android and you can check it out by typing in Trading212 into your respective App Store. So thank you so much Trading212 for sponsoring this episode. You mentioned you're, you're a perfectionist yourself. Yes. What sort of perfectionist traits do you see in yourself? Uh, worry about what other people think, worry about uh, whether I'm doing enough, uh, worry about my place and whether I belong. Uh, imposter phenomenon is quite strong among perfectionists, particularly perfectionists that have come from you know, uh, I've come from a working class background into a middle class world and you often doubt yourself. You wonder if you deserve to be there. You wonder if your work's of a certain standard. You look around and see people who are doing so much better than you or how you, you think are doing so much better than you and, you. and you think inside, I have to prove every day that I'm good enough, that I deserve to be here and that I'm trying to disguise this kind of flawed and inadequate person that I think I am inside. Now I'm doing so much better now. This was something that consumed me in my twenties and led to quite significant mental health problems, which is prom what prompted me to really take an interest in this topic. I'm able to let things go now. I'm able to try to strive a bit more like my grandfather, 
accepted his striving and kind of let things go and accept that not everybody's going to be happy with what you say and not everybody's going to think that your work is amazing and that's okay that you know sometimes you're going to slip up and do a really bad lecture or answer a question in a way that's suboptimal and also that's okay so i'm learning i'm learning mm. uh, to get on top of my perfectionism but nevertheless it's certainly something that i i definitely suffer with so what strategies have you used to get better at this over the last, I'd say, like say 10 years? The biggest one for me is to just let life happen. And I think there's a real impulse in this culture to happen in the world as if everything and all around us can be mastered, can be perfected, um, can it in some way be overcome. Sometimes for no good reason we fail. Sometimes things happen to us that we have no control over. And accepting that fact is really the first big step in breaking through perfectionism because then you are ready and prepared for, for to have a sort of goal in your mind of where you want to go. That you're kind of aware that this is where I want to be. But you know that the journey to get there is not going to be straightforward. It's going to have... Uh, lots of headwinds, lots of stumbling blocks, lots of setbacks, things that you can't control, that you have to be very agile in navigating, that you have to accept that sometimes you're going to stand still and go nowhere for a few months. Sometimes you're even going to regress. You know, you're going to think you've mastered something and suddenly something comes along that teaches you, actually, you didn't know what you were doing in the first place. You have to relearn these things. And so life is really a jagged path. And instead of kind of trying to meet every setback by trying to force yourself forward and avoid uh, encountering those difficulties, putting things off, procrastinating, worrying about what other people think, just allowing it, allowing the anxiety in, allowing the worry in, and allow, just sitting comfortably next to, next to situations and things aren't quite going to plan and keeping on going, keeping on towards that ultimate goal. I think that for me is the biggest, the biggest difference between how I used to think and how I think now, because it's so much more psychologically liberating when you can understand that things aren't gonna always go to plan mm. and that's okay. We can sit with that. Mm. Yeah, that seems to be a thing that, I mean, almost every spiritual teaching also goes towards that. Like, you know, if even if we think of the ancient philosophies like Stoicism, it seems like all of these different ways of tackling life uh, end up on the conclusion of allow things to happen as they are, live in the present moment, don't live in the past or in the future, which causes essentially sadness and anxiety, worrying about the future. But if we can just focus on what's within our control yes. and just keep going, put one foot in front of the other, all, all of those cliches, but they, I think those cliches are cliche for a reason because there's like universal truth behind them. Yeah. But also I think they're almost too easy to dismiss in the sense that if someone is struggling with perfectionism, they might hear about, I don't know, Epictetus's like dichotomy of control or whatever and be like, oh yeah, of course I should, you know, just do the, you know, you know, God grant me the serenity to accept that, <laughs> that, that which I, can, I can't control. But it's a lot easier said than done. Absolutely. Um, and it's easier yeah. for some people than it is for others. And let's be honest about this. A lot of uh, self-help is predicated on this notion that, you know, um, be more meditative, positive thinking, caring for yourself when things haven't gone well. These are all very noble things to advise. But some people are in situations where doing those things, being authentic, letting things happen, is a really difficult thing to do. Because if you're poor and you let things happen, and things don't go well, the impact of that is can be catastrophic. That can mean losing your tenancy. It could be surviving on minimum wage. So, the, so you know, I think this is why I try to impress in the book that you know, this, this idea of kind of letting things go isn't created equally. For some people, the consequences of that are far more severe than other people. And I think we have to be really uh, cognizant as a, as a society that yes, there are individual things that we can do that are important, but we also as a, as a collective have a responsibility to help people become more serene in the way that they live, allow things to happen and, and that the consequences of when things go wrong be not as catastrophic as sometimes they can be in today's society. So yes, it's an individual's uh, 
uh, issue that I think, a lot, you know, that we need to work on, but also as a collective, I think there's things we can do as a society mm. too. So I just, I think one of the things I'm really keen to caveat in this book is not just go all in on this kind of authenticity, be vulnerable, show yourself, allow things to happen without also acknowledging that that's easier for some people to do than that is for others. Yeah, no, that's a good point. There's that, there's that classic thing that people say around, you know, anxiety and things that like, oh, you know, it's, you know, fundamentally rooted in fear. The amygdala was designed to, you know, save us from getting mauled by a saber-toothed tiger and was also in caveman eras designed to help us combat social threats. Yeah. And now it's gone haywire because actually those same survival mechanisms are no longer serving us. Yeah. But I guess what we're saying is that actually for some people, they are genuinely survival mechanisms. Yeah. If you can't make rent and you end up on the streets, that is a survival mechanism it is, it really is. compared to if your book does not hit the New York Times bestseller list and only hits the Sunday Times or whatever the hell, whatever the hell is. <laughs> There's like, there are different levels of actually some things are threatening people's survival and others aren't uh, in, in as great a degree. Yeah. I guess either way, you can't really, <laughs> whatever the consequences, you can only really control what's under your control. But it's, it's way easier said than done, especially if your survival is genuinely being threatened. Absolutely. And I think this is really important for people to recognize that you can acknowledge the world needs to change. You can want the world to change and you can also meet the world where it is. Those two things are not mutually exclusive and that's our challenge uh, for for us to accept that, you know, we do live in a very tilted economy, a lopsided economy, um, and it is tough for a lot of people and becoming tougher as we enter into a cost of living crisis and and young people in particular find it really difficult to get on things like the housing ladder and and uh, start families and all the rest of it i think it's really really important that we can recognize those, those issues we can we can understand that they are impacting on the way we feel particularly on our perfectionistic thoughts and feelings because we try to overcompensate for those structural things by working harder want them to change, but also allow ourselves to meet the world where it is, let setbacks in, let those things wash over us a little bit, as frustrating and you know, uh, anxiety provoking as they are, um, and, and live, as you, as you mentioned, with a, a little bit more contentment, a little bit more serenity, wanting things to change, maybe even agitating for that change, but also accepting mm. the, where we are, our life circumstances. Um, and I think that's, for me, that's the key. And that's that's what's helped me break through my perfections. Nice. Um, Want to tackle many more action points because we have lots of action points in the book. Uh, but before we do that, I thought we'd touch on the multidimensional model of perfectionism. So we kind of alluded to this a little bit when talking about Asians versus white people, but like, um, what is the multi multi-dimensional model of perfectionism? So the multi-dimensional model of perfectionism is really a, a, an acknowledgement that perfectionism is more than just personal steps. So... As I mentioned, perfectionism really starts with this kind of deficit thinking, but that can be expressed in so many different ways. And over decades of talking to perfectionistic people, we've realized that perfectionism isn't just about, I need to be perfect. And uh, if I'm not perfect, I'm highly self-critical of myself. This is called self-oriented perfectionism, right? Self-oriented perfectionism comes from self. And yes, this is a very dominant aspect of perfectionism, particularly in individualistic cultures, but it's not the only one. Speaking to perfectionistic people, that we also find is a particularly pernicious social route to perfectionism too. So the sen sense that uh, perfectionistic people tend to feel like the social environment uh, around them is highly expectant of perfection and is very judgmental. And it's called socially prescribed perfectionism. So socially prescribed perfectionism, perfectionists kind of hear very snide remarks about them everywhere they go. They feel like people are judging them highly and, they, and they're expected to be perfect. And then there's a third aspect called other into perfectionism, which is kind of perfectionism that's turned outwards onto other people. So I expect you to be perfect. And if you're not perfect, then I'm very judgmental and very harsh and very punitive. And these three aspects of perfectionism are really what we understand to be a multi-dimensional uh, model of perfectionism that isn't just one thing like high standards, high self-set standards and striving, but also has social elements like social prescribed and also other oriented. And together, these are the three aspects of perfectionism that I outline in the book. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to read out a few, um, you know, for people in um, who, who are watching or listening, this is, I think, one of the the multi-dimensional perfectionism scales, just to give people a sense yeah. of these these three different things. So self-oriented perfectionism. And I guess as, you, as you're listening or watching to this, um, sort of have a think about like, to what extent do you kind of agree or disagree with these phrases as they relate to you? 
So self-oriented perfectionism, I must be perfect at the things that matter to me. If I screw up or fall short, I'm hard on myself. I hold myself to an exceptionally high standard. If I do not appear or perform perfectly, I feel a lot of guilt and shame, and I strive to be perfect. And those are all the self-oriented perfectionism things. We've got five things for socially prescribed perfectionism. When I slip up or fall short, people are right there waiting to criticize me. Everyone else is perfect, and they're judging me if I'm not perfect too. Those close to me will accept nothing less than perfection. People tend to get upset with me if I don't do things perfectly, and everybody expects me to be perfect. And then we have other-oriented perfectionism. I find it difficult to tolerate substandard performances from those around me. If people aren't trying their absolute hardest, I let them know. Everyone should totally excel at things that are important to them. When someone close to me screws up or falls short, it's important to call them out. And I dislike being surrounded by people who've got low standards. Um, so we'll put this questionnaire in the show notes and the video description as well. If you fancy whoever's listening to this, um, sort of uh, rating yourself on these things. Um, the other oriented perfectionism one I thought was interesting because I would not have thought that that would come under the definition of perfectionism because that's more like having high standards, I guess, or perfectionistic standards for the people around you. Yes, but you have to uh, remember where it comes from. So other oriented perfectionists are, are doing what Freud would call projection. So this sense that, you know, I have a burning need to be perfect. And if I'm going to haul myself over hot coals to get there, you are going to do it too, because that's only fair. And so you tend to find that people high in, high in perfectionistic tendencies can sometimes uh, point those tendencies out. It's not all the time, you know, not everyone is an avoidance perfectionist. A lot of people like myself wouldn't dream of of, of imposing the standards that I pl place on myself, but you tend, you can find that some people do. And a good example would be Steve Jobs is someone I write about in the book. Who's clearly a, an, you know, incredible, uh, entrepreneur business person is, you know, one of the most successful, if not the most successful, uh, in the, in the world. Um, but you know, he was a complicated man at the same time. And, and, uh, uh, autobiographical accounts show that he was a perfectionistic person, uh, expected perfection in his own life, expected perfection of himself, but also importantly, expected perfection of other people. And when they weren't up to his standard, they, he let them know. And, and that is an, an example of someone who has high standards for themselves, but can sometimes turn them out onto other people. And that's why we, we find sometimes, you know, when perfectionistic people talk to us, come into the, uh, you know, a clinical uh, uh, environment or even just come into a research environment and they tell us about their perfectionism, one of the things sometimes we see is this kind of other point of perfectionism. Mm, okay. And do you find that those people are also like, uh, or tend to be perfectionistic in themselves or can you have pure other oriented perfectionism without actually feeling the effects of it your own in, internally? Really good question. Uh, don't touch on this in the book actually, but it, let's go into it because it is it is a it is a very, very interesting question. So the answer is it depends. So what we tend to see is those who've got high levels of perfectionism, self-oriented perfectionism, fused with or combined with high levels of other-oriented perfectionism, right, can can demonstrate what we would consider to be really highly perfectionistic tendencies that has an impact on them and those around them, mm. and that can have negative consequences for their social relationships. It can also have a negative uh, consequence for their own mental health. Now, there is a case that we've looked at in the literature where you can see these high standards divorced from perfectionism, but fused with something called narcissism. And so we call this kind of narcissistic perfectionism, which is something that I, I haven't touched on in the book because I think it's quite, quite separate um, to the issues that I wanted to tackle. But nevertheless, there's some really interesting studies on this that I've done myself where you tend to find other into perfectionism uh, doesn't come with perfectionistic tendencies, but instead comes fused with narcissism. And so these people have a sort of grandiose uh, view of themselves and therefore they they uh, almost kind of channel that grandiosity into expectations that they th they, they expect for other people. And um, and that isn't necessarily, you know, it doesn't have the same uh, interpersonal consequences as to say psychological consequences for the person themselves, but has significant and implications for the people that these these uh, individuals interact with yeah. because um, it's a very, very draining. Let's imagine you had a narcissistic perfectionist boss 
that would be a very draining way to work. That would be an extremely difficult working environment, trying to navigate those tendencies. Um, and so you can have it without self-oriented perfectionism um, and it can be fused with narcissism. I'm just thinking back to all my interactions with my team and thinking, uh-oh, <laughs> have I? <laughs> but okay, so, so what are the, again, what's the, what's the difference between having high standards and being a narcissistic perfectionist? Is it just a matter of degree? Well, let's put it this way. The perfectionist doesn't believe the bulletproof narrative they're trying to construct for themselves deep down, right? They feel like they're inefficient, they're flawed, and they're not worth anything. And that's why they try to project perfection to prove to other people and gain the validation and approval of other people so that as kind of props for their self-esteem, which is really low. Narcissists are very different their self-esteem is really high because they believe the narrative, the bulletproof narrative that they're constructing for themselves. They actually take on that image and think that they are um, the perfect worker boss, that they, you know, that they're projecting outside onto other people. That's the critical difference between a perfectionist and a narcissist. Okay, got it. Um, in what way does perfectionism contribute to lower, I guess, productivity? Okay, that's a, I love this question because the answer is fascinating. So you would think, wouldn't you, that perfectionists would succeed? And that's kind of very uh, common uh, conventional wisdom, I guess, in broader society, right? The perfectionists are these kind of really high overstrivers and as a consequence, they succeed. We know that there's baggage. We know that there's kind of mental health problems that can coexist with perfectionism, but on the other hand, these these people are really high achievers and you know you can point to high pro perfectionists serena williams victoria pendleton steve jobs uh, demi lovato you know all these people who self-confessed perfection made it to the top of their professions clearly really talented and high achieving and therefore it must be the perfectionism that, that propelled them there when we look at the data however we find no relationship between perfectionism and performance and this is really curious because they work so hard, they put everything into their activities and yet they don't seem to perform any better. Why is that? Well, there's two reasons. One reason is that they work hard, but they work too hard. So what you tend to see is this kind of declining and then diminishing returns to any un extra unit of input. So they work to the max and then beyond. They sacrifice rejuvenating activities like diet, sleep, good uh, healthy behaviors like exercise, for instance. We know they're rejuvenating. We know these things help with work performance. They don't do them, they burn out. And we know there's strong correlation with infections and the burnout. So this is kind of one of the reasons why professionals struggle to perform, perhaps to the, to the extent that their effort would, would suggest they should do. But the second reason is a really fascinating reason and one that we've been really keen to look at in the lab. And the second reason is perfectionists find it really tough when things start to go wrong. So if you give perfectionists a task to do, you say, look, you should comfortably achieve this uh, outcome uh, on this task and you say go ahead and do it so we put people in the lab let's and we use sport because sports are really good microcosm of sort of more competitive uh, society more generally and we say okay you should comfortably complete this distance in this time on this cycling task right so go away and do it we get them to do it they work really really hard and then at the end we tell them unfortunately you didn't quite make the target we set and then we do something really naughty we say try again now, the perfectionistic people, when they are given that failure feedback, feel so sh ashamed of that and embarrassed of that failure that they will do everything they possibly can to avoid feeling those things again. So on the second trial, what we see is the effort drops off a cliff because you can't fail at something you didn't try. So as soon as they encounter situations of almost certain defeat, where they know putting everything of themselves into it is not going to end well, they just withhold. Now, people who aren't particularly perfectionistic do the complete opposite. When we tell them to do it again, their effort doesn't change. If anything, it goes up slightly. And that is another reason why perfectionists really struggle to perform because it's fine when things are going well. But as soon as things start to go wrong, and there's a high chance of failure, they withdraw themselves. Now that's in the lab. How does that look in real life? Well, in real life, they procrastinate. They find 
anxiety provoking situations, things that are really tough, really hard to get going. They see the task ahead of them. They know it's going to be too challenging. And so the mental energy and the anxiety that that's stirring up in them is so fierce that they'll just completely hold the hold effort. So they'll stop doing things. They'll procrastinate. They'll watch the latest Netflix series. They'll go and cook up the latest TikTok recipe. Anything to avoid facing the anxiety of doing a task that needs to get done. Now, of course, that helps. It eases that anxiety for that moment. But in the end, they're just damaged by the passage of time. And as a consequence, the work goes in late or it's substandard or it's not as good as it could have been because we're under these time pressures because of the withdrawal and the procrastination that we're engaging in, which again is not conducive to high performance. So it's a really, really fascinating topic, this one. And I wanted to cover it in a, in a, a separate chapter in the book because I think it's really important that people understand that yes, perfectionism has a kind of sense that it, it's this, you know, positive motivational force but actually when you dig deeper when you look closer you tend to find that perfectionists really struggle to perform mm. it's almost like a self-sabotaging behavior right yeah exactly that is exactly what it is perfectionists are world-class self-sabotages <laughs> is this something that you struggled with absolutely i mean you know my book is two years overdue <laughs> My editor was ready to throttle me, I think, as a, you know, as I was still tinkering with it at the, you know, the day before it was to go to press. Uh, you know, we just can't help ourselves because we just want things to be perfect and we find it really challenging psychologically for them not to be. So we tinker, we iterate, we work too hard, we put things off, um, we we kind of manage our anxiety in suboptimal ways. And uh, obviously a better way to handle that would just be to get things done, to get things on the page. You know, it's the idea that done is better than perfect. I know that. And I try as hard as I can to engage with that mantra, but it's tough. Particularly when you're putting a book out into the world, you know, for everyone to read. I mean, that's really, that's a big thing. Yeah, hey, I know the feeling. Um, <laughs> one of the things that um, my writing coach helped me realize was I had a lot of perfectionistic tendencies when it came to writing a book. Mm -hmm. And I don't really have those with making YouTube videos, even though a YouTube video might get a million views, which is more views than my book is ever going to sell copies of. <laughs> so like for some reason, when it comes to a YouTube video, I feel more chill about putting myself out there in that sense. I guess because I've made like 700 of them at this point over the last six years. But the thought of a book, oh my God, a book is a big deal. Yeah. And my writing coach was like, why are you thinking that a book is a big deal? I was like, I don't know, because there's in bookshops. And he was like, why does that make it a big deal? And we kind of like went on this line of questioning. And I kind of realized the reason a book is a big deal is because it is more open to criticism than a random video is. Because a random video will be seen by people who already like me, and that's fine. But a book might be bought by someone who doesn't know who I am, doesn't know anything about me, and I can just imagine the Amazon reviews. This guy thinks he knows anything about productivity. What a <laughs> freaking twat. Like, how dare he suggest that, like, blah, 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 blah. And I can just imagine reading those and knowing in my, in my mind that, yeah, Hater's going to hate. And, you know, this person's just expressing a preference and, like, it's all good, water under the bridge. But in reality, the, the feeling of, like, oh, no, <laughs> my yeah. work is being criticized and judged. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, at some level, it's going it, to, you, you can try to brush it off, but at some level, it's always going to impact you, right? And I think it's really interesting what you say in terms of, you know, you have a level of comfort with the, with the things that you know you do well the things that you know uh, attract viewers that gain a lot of um, attention. Whereas with something that you're not quite sure about yet because it's the first time you've done it and you haven't really tested it with, with the outside world, that can be really like psychologically that can be a real challenge. So I think it's, it's you, what you're expressing there is, you know, what I feel, I think what most people feel, and it isn't just, you know, about writing books. It's whenever we push ourselves out of our comfort zone, there's always that trepidation. And if you're perfectionistic, that trepidation is going to be amplified. Nice. So we spent um, some time talking about, I guess, uh, the misconceptions and the causes and the kind of root causes of perfectionism. And we've hinted on one of the action points that you found helpful, which was this thing of letting life wash over you and being being okay with how things turn out. I wonder if we can go over some more action points. So for someone listening and watching this far who might vibe with perfectionism in their own life, yeah. what are some other things that we can do to get over perfectionism or at least reduce the impact that it might have on us? Okay. So I think there's really, first of all, first and foremost, before we do anything else, I think it's really important to appreciate 
where perfection is coming from. And I want readers to, to pick up my book and come away with a sense that this isn't your fault. Like there are a broader context to these feelings that actually your society and economy is designed, structured, organized to instill a sense of deficiency because if you didn't feel deficient, if you felt content, you wouldn't consume, you wouldn't work, and our economy would quite quickly and abruptly spiral into a recession at that point, which is the worst kind of depression, uh, recession, a demand driven, uh, a demand deficit driven recession, which would create all sorts of uh, havoc. So this feeling of being not enough is really fundamental to the way in which your society is structured. I really want people to bear this in mind because I think this takes a lot of power away from that deficit thinking to understand that, okay, this is the system working. This is a system working exceptionally well. Perfectionism is really, why is perfectionism? It's evidence that the system works, that we have created um, uh, a, a, a situation and a culture in which people feel compelled to consume and work as hard as they possibly can uh, in order to, prove themselves of worth in this society. And if we can understand that, if we can wrap our head around that, then that is the most important starting point. This is not your fault. These feelings have a broader context and it's okay. Now, from there, what can we do? Well, I talk about in my book, the fundamental role of self-acceptance, because I think self-acceptance is really like taking a sledgehammer to perfectionism. And underneath that broad philosophy are some actionable things we can do. And the first is self-compassion. Mm. Now we have to at all times treat ourselves with kindness. If you screw up a presentation, kindness. If you didn't get the grade you wanted in your assessment, kindness. Okay. If you went to work and your annual review came back and it wasn't quite as good as you were expecting, don't go out of that room with your boss and berate yourself. How could it be so stupid? What was I thinking? Why didn't I put in more effort? Why didn't I work on weekends or evenings or whatever to, to make sure that this didn't happen? Kindness. It's okay. It did my best. I worked hard. Nobody's perfect. I made mistakes. We're human. And to be human is to be imperfect. If we can learn to treat ourselves with kindness every, every time something goes wrong, we will instantly start to break down those self-critical features of perfectionism that make it such a difficult personality trait to carry around. Now that's not easy and it takes time and practice. You're not going to do it straight away. I still come out of my lectures if I've done a bad job or I think I've done a bad job and ask myself, what was I thinking? Mm. But instantly I'm turning that around and saying, okay, you know, it's one bad lecture out of many, many that I give. It's not going to impact my future career. <laughs> it's not as catastrophic as you instantly think it is. It's just one bad day at the office. Mm. The second thing is to challenge our perfectionism in, in, in important ways. So being self-critical after setbacks is crucial, but also putting ourselves in situations where we encounter setbacks is also crucial. Remember I talked about perfection can recoil from those situations. It's really, really important to try to push yourselves into them instead. So if you don't feel like one of your talents is speaking, for instance, push yourself at work to do a talk. Go through the anxiety that that engenders. Just sit with it. Let it wash over you for a little bit and then go out there and do it. And you will almost always find at the end of that talk that the impact or the feedback or the consequence of it was not as catastrophic as you thought it was going to be. Look, look, it might not be a, you know, a polished erudite speech that maybe you see on a TED talk. It might not be that, but at the same time, it also is likely to have been an experience where you've learned something where you stood in front of people and conquered that fear and tried to push through and break through your perfectionism. Those are really important things to take away because those things that you can learn, that help you develop, that help you become more confident and, as, and importantly, help you break through your perfectionism is by taking those small steps out of your comfort zone. So challenging your perfectionism is, is really important. Try to do that as much as you can. And thirdly, and this is really important, always remember that whatever you do, Failure is not humiliating, it's humanizing, it's normal and natural to fail. In fact, we will fail way more than we will succeed. You have one success, it's followed by infinite amounts of failure. 
because failure is just regression to the mean. It's it's a, it's an it's it's an indication that we're moving in a direction that we're learning that we're developing. And re it's really important to remember that failure is part and parcel of that process. It's not humiliating. It's not something shameful that needs to be um, rehabilitated at all times. It is just what it is. It's a part and parcel of human growth, human development. Um, and I think that's so, so important. We need to change our relationship with failure and remember that it's a very humanizing part of the human condition. So those, are, I think, are the main three things that I think... I would like readers to take away from the book. Right, we're going to take a very quick break from the podcast to introduce our sponsor, which is Brilliant.org. Brilliant has been a supporter of my channel for the last several years. I've been using their product for the last several years, and it's the best app I've ever found for online courses in maths and science and computer science. The courses are really fun and interactive and engaging, and you learn stuff and then you apply it with a practical puzzle, and you learn a bit more, and then you apply it a bit more. So it's generally a way more engaging and interesting way of learning stuff compared to how we might have been taught in school, for example. My favorite courses on Brilliant are the computer science courses. So back when I was applying to med school, I was actually torn between medicine and computer science, and I went for medicine in the end, which I don't regret. But there was always a part of me that really wanted to understand how computer science works. And so when I started taking the computer science courses on Brilliant, it really helped me understand, like, at a deep level, what the deal is with the basics of computer computer science. Like they've got a fantastic course, Introduction to Algorithms. They've got a whole course on cryptocurrencies, which is all about how cryptocurrencies actually work and how the kind of SHA-256 encryption works. And it teaches the topic of cryptography and security in a really fun and engaging way, which is way better than any other explanation I found on the internet. Anyway, if any of that sums up your street and you would like to level up your knowledge and your thinking in terms of maths or science or computer science, then do head over to brilliant.org forward slash deep dive. And the first 200 people to use that link, which is also in the video description and in the show notes, will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So thank you so much, Brilliant, for sponsoring this episode. And let's get right back to the podcast. To the point about self-compassion, uh, a book that I've recently reread um, in the last week is called Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It by a guy <laughs> called Kamal Ravikant. And I read it a few years ago and I was like, eh, eh, it's a bit woo. It's a bit like, you know, hand weavy. And then I read it again last week. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, this is actually actually really solid. And one of the exercises, you know, this guy talks about, you know, he was a successful like investor startup guy and had a lot of struggles with mental health and perfectionism and depression and things. And one very actionable strategy that he found really helpful is just, you know, throughout the day, reminding himself to take a, to take a few breaths. And when breathing in, just literally telling himself, I love myself. And I've been trying this for the last few days where I'm just like, you know, as I'm walking, walking down, walking towards the car while listening to an audiobook at 3x speed on my AirPods, just like looking up, taking a breath and just sort of saying to myself internally, I love myself and then breathing out. And the way he, he describes it is like, imagine taking a deep breath and imagine like light from above coming into your system. And then as you breathe out, that light is going into the areas of your body where it, it, it most needs to go. And I was like, nah, come on, come on. This is, this is bollocks. And I tried it. Uh, I was like, oh, I, I actually do just feel better. And there's something about that um, that's profoundly, you know, like, you know just, just that active act of self-compassion. Because the way, you know, as, as, as you would know, if we, the, the way that we operate in life is mostly sort of system one, mostly uh, instinct based on yeah. Ha having a thought repeatedly and then that thought gets uh, solidified and the grooves form in our mind and so it becomes way easier to have that thought and so if the thought going through our mind is I'm not worthy I'm not good enough I'm a failure and we repeat those often enough those become the default paths through the through the forest of our mind whereas if we can just tell ourselves a couple of times a day I love myself and that thought then becomes a default that just changes the way that we approach almost every situation in life so I've been finding that really powerful over the last few days I think it's so powerful. It's it's just, as I said, it's like taking a sledgehammer to perfectionism. You know, you know, your perfection, your the perfectionists will always find ways that they didn't succeed, or they didn't do something perfectly, or they, or there was always some chink in the armory that they will find, even if you've done something exceptionally well. In fact, you know, even objectively high levels of achievement to perfectionists aren't enough because success is a bottomless pit. It depletes us in its pursuit. And just like the horizon, it keeps slipping away the further we get to it. This is how perfectionism operates within the mindset of people. And so, of course, you know, when things don't go well, we're going to turn on ourselves because we weren't perfect in that moment. And exactly what you've just said, if we can turn that 
or reframe those thoughts from instantly turning on ourselves to instantly telling ourselves it's okay that you are enough that actually you know there's a sense of love and appreciation for ourselves in this moment how we are right now it's that's so powerful one of the places I'm trying to get to, and I'm, I'm not here yet, uh, but it seems like a lot of more spiritually enlightened people are here, is instead, so like what, what one level is like you fail at something and you're like, oh, I'm a failure, I'm a terrible person. The next level is you fail at something and you're like, that's fine. You know, it was just a bad day at the office. But then it feels like the next level up is almost not even registering as, as a failure. Because mm. a failure or even a success is mm. a value judgment. Mm -hmm. It's a story that we tell ourselves about the flow of life. Mm -hmm. And if we can just surrender to the flow of life mm -hmm. and allow things to be as they are and not give it the value definite, the value judgment of this was good or this was bad. Mm -hmm. Oh, that would be such a, a freeing way to live, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not there yet, but it's like, you know, a path to work towards. It, it would, but the way society is at the moment, uh, but uh, you'll quickly be let know <laughs> if yeah. it wasn't good, particularly the higher you go, right? Like if you're a content creator like yourself, you know, if you put out something that isn't quite of the standard of the other videos, people are going to be right there to let you know. And mm. it's so, it's one thing to to say, okay, you know, there's a value judgment on things not going quite as, as well as you want, but there's also... Uh, having to kind of do that kind of thought process in a in a society in a and a world, particularly you know online world, uh, where you'll be reminded very quickly. Yeah. So it's that's the challenge. Yeah, that's the challenge exactly. <laughs> yeah, like one. <laughs> I sometimes think like when it when it comes to kind of uh, negative comments on the internet, one very reasonable approach is to just not read them. Mm -hmm. um, but I I I I'd, I'd I'd like to get to the point where. I can read them and they'll just wash over me. And it's just like, it's a spiritual training almost. It's train, training of the mind. But, you know, so, <laughs> I will uh, let the audience know when I ever get, if I ever get there, but I don't think it's going to happen anytime <laughs> soon. Um, one thing that you say in the book is um, to give up a status position as like a, a, an actionable thing. What do, you, what do you mean by that? One of the things that I think is really challenging right now, and I, I, I dedicate a chapter to this is, uh, is the omnipresence of consumer culture. Um, and I talk about my own experiences in the book growing up um, poor and going to school and seeing all around me people who have the best trainers, the newest phones. And as you, as we've gone into the sixth form, you know, the these kind of new cars and this kind of excess that you'd see that was kind of ways of marking people's states. And of course, you know, all of those kids were the kids who had the schoolyard cred. You know, they were the people that people looked up to because consumer culture and cultures of success teach us to be embarrassed about any part of our lives that don't match up. Like there's something wrong with you if you don't have these things. And I think one of the, the key lessons really is that I definitely got myself wrapped up in that. Uh, I, I definitely looked at uh, other people around me and just yearned, wanted, craved for the things that they had. And it, and it was really psychologically problematic. And I started to try to fit, plug those holes in material things. When I was in my twenties, I used to buy a lot of, you know, the best fashion items and, um, you know, the spend well beyond comfort on things like watches and, and, uh, and, and cars and 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 kind of to, to kind of compensate, I suppose, for those feelings of deficit that I had when I was younger. And for me, when I say give up a status position, what I'm really saying is, is, is try to not to let your status or your or your worth be defined by things outside of yourself. So it, it might be really hard, like to I don't know, put down the Rolex watch for a moment and and go out with a an Omega or something, you know, whatever it might be. It might feel hard because you might feel that that's going to mark you in some kind of negative way. And and what I'm trying to say is to break down those perfectionistic tendencies. It isn't just about kind of putting yourself out there, embracing failure, feeling setbacks, and all the rest of it, but also letting go of things that you think are. Uh, external markers of your self-worth and that can be material possession certainly was for me and that was one of the biggest you know breakthroughs for me when I started to let go not just of successes or failures but also things that I thought marked me as a higher or lower status person and so those possessions I think are you know really important I think, uh, add, uh, there's a really famous quote I can't remember the psychotherapist name now it's not coming to my mind um, but he said whenever we are excessive in our lives it is normally a indication of some internal deprivation 
And I think that's that's very true. Certainly my experience that, you know, being excessive with material things was plugging a hole for something that I was missing in myself. Yeah. Um, so that's what I'm trying to get across there. Yeah, nice. Um, there's a good, I, I, you know, I, th I think I either read this in Happy by Darren Brown or in William Irvine's Guide to the Good Life, which are both books about stoicism, but a good mental model of when it comes to possessions, which is if there were no one else in the world, would I still want this thing? Mm. And obviously it's a somewhat flawed, so like, you know, mental <laughs> model, because if there was no one else in the world, then life might be quite lonely. Uh, but I think it does speak to a thing of, am I buying this for the signaling that it represents, or am I buying this thing because I actually want this thing exactly. or for a more intrinsic reason? And I think that running things through that filter, um, at least for me, you know, I'd still buy a book, even if like there was no one else in the world because it's like, I want to read the book. But would I still buy a Canada Goose jacket if there was no one else in the world? Probably not. Like there's something about having the logo on the shoulder pad that feels feels good and it's like hmm interesting yeah and whenever i like when i when i buy things i like to run them through that filter and if the answer is oh i probably wouldn't buy this if there was no one else in the world then i at least think twice before buying the thing because then i know that like okay fundamentally i'm buying this to signal something to signal some sense of status or whatever and that's not necessarily the worst thing in the world, but I think being aware of it is is the first step. <laughs> yeah, I think like obviously, you know, move, high profile individuals like, you know, millionaires of TikTok and people like, you know, Andrew Tate who have kind of amplified these unrealistic expectations of how one should, you know, the good life, I suppose. Mm. Uh, exactly like you said, you know, a lot of peacocking, a lot of very extravagant spending to kind of mark our status and our worth in the world. And I suppose, you know, like you said, it's, I, if, look, it's, yeah, if you want to buy nice things, there's nothing wrong with that. Like if it, and, and if it makes you feel good, if there's something about it that intrinsically uh, is fulfilling and gives you something in your life, there's nothing wrong with that. And if that happens to be a state of possession, then fine. But it's it's why you're buying it. It's why you're trying to signal your worth in this way. And I think mm. if you, you know, it can be it can be exhausting and quite uh, difficult for our mental health if we continue trying to upscale our lives. Um, and it goes back to this idea that, you know, contentment, what we have, meet ourselves where we are, those are the important things. That's the one. Um, what are your thoughts on social media? Social media. I actually really think that social media has such power to be an incredibly useful tool uh, in a in a disconnected world, uh, it can bring people together around shared interests. It can facilitate offline relations. That to say, it can help with meeting up uh, groups. It can help uh, bring diverse people together. It can help really solidify community. All of these things were, by the way, what it was originally set up to do as a social network in the truest sense of the word. So when Facebook first came out, it was a university thing. So it was to, you know, kind of grease the wheels of university and campus life and credulous college students like me used to use it to kind of organize football uh, socials or, you know, set up uh, a drinking circles or go you know f you know uh bring together different types of communities within the university around shared interests and this is what it was used for you know it really helped university community and bring people together on campus but unfortunately it isn't that anymore and what it is is an advertising device uh, it's really it. that's where the you know, profits made and 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 so the imperative of the social media algorithms now are not to facilitate offline relationships but to keep people online to keep them at, you know engaged with the app scrolling through flicking through pictures again uh, instilling a sense that you know that you could be more there's these images of other people's lives and lifestyles that appear very perfect and you could have this if only, if only, oh, and here's a targeted ad. Right when you're at your, you kind of, you most need, ah, and this is what I need to buy in order to have this life and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So social media has become kind of an advertising device that follows the traditional route of analog advertising, but kind of puts it on steroids, uh, amplifies unrealistic ideals so that targeted ads can can provide material solutions. And it ha And it's not a social network anymore, it's an advertising device. And I think that's where the damage can come. So social media per se is not a negative thing. Um, it can, it's got tremendous power to be incredibly enlivening, but 
at the moment it has uh, in my opinion this is this is just my reader social media but in my opinion it, it's it gearing itself towards creating those kind of aspects of discontent that are very catnip for perfectionism catnip for advertisers mm. keep us consuming keep us working harder to attain this kind of life and lifestyle it's projected as 24 7 in social media so my opinion on social media is quite nuanced i think it's got a lot of potential it's got a lot of power but at the moment it's the algorithms are designed in a way that can create more discontent than purpose hmm so what are the strategies maybe around social media for people who struggle with perfectionism? I think it's really about learning what what social media is first and foremost, understanding that it is an advertising device. You know, the, you know, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, they're not, uh, they don't disguise this. Uh, they talk about how ad revenues are really the revenue streams for their platforms. They're very open about it. Um, and it's just about understanding that. You know, if we can approach social media understanding that the way it makes money is through advertising and the way advertising works is that we are, you know, kind of lured into a sense that we need a product. Mm. And so social media works on this deficit model. We can understand that as a first step. And then the second step is to go back to what it was originally for. So engage with Instagram, but on interests that are, you know, are important to you. Yep. Like build a community around things that, you know, whether it be pets or cooking or cycling or whatever it might be, use Instagram to really facilitate those offline relationships, to meet people and spend time in the world outside of social media with other people uh, i think going back to social media as its original purpose is really really important and for young people i think education is so crucial i think if you're a parent it's really important to educate young people in what social media is about and how it can be used positively um in terms of build, you know uh, facilitating offline relations um, so, so for me, it's just it's really about engaging in it with it in the right way mm. it's not about getting rid of it altogether hmm yeah, makes a lot of sense. I think one thing that I like to do is, um, you know, I get a lot of value from Twitter, weirdly. And people always are surprised by that. And, you know, whenever I say to people, oh, yeah, you know, t Twitter is a great source of information and insight and everything. They're like, but wait, what? I thought Twitter was just for the news and for like dunking on Andrew Tate or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of it is about curating the people that you follow and curating your feed so that it does give you great book recommendations and stuff rather than kind of, vitriol or hate or like lifestyle aspirationally type things yeah and so i like to keep my feeds broadly educational adjacent um with the occasional like you know male fitness model to inspire me to actually go to the gym uh, <laughs> <laughs> i find that like that level of um kind of nudge towards from social media it's like oh well you know if i see a, a photo of a gym shark athlete on the thing i'll be like you know what i'm gonna go gym today and i think that's broadly a healthy thing even though probably the reason behind it might be like my body's not good enough yeah i don't like you know there are there are there, there are worse outcomes other than i'm gonna go gym today <laughs> <laughs> i mean look you know people use uh, social media in their own ways and i, I think I'm, I'm also a user of twitter i think you know the, the world we live in right now is is one where there's a lot of uh impetus to kind of like you say dunk on people to kind of um to for, for views for shares for likes for mentions you know kind of extreme views are amplified and uh views are polarized within those uh settings but like you said if you can use it in a way that's broadly positive you can follow the right people you make sure that your feed is um managed so that you don't see too much of this kind of scrap screeching and noise then it's obviously a very positive thing. You keep up with the news. You can, you know, you can you can gain insight from influencers who you think are, have some really valuable stuff to share. It's a positive experience, but again, it's about managing that is is the important part, um, and understanding that you know there's good things and bad things about the about the platforms. Yeah. Um, okay. Something potentially controversial that you say in the book is that you don't believe in the growth mindset. Mm -hmm. What what do you mean you don't believe in the growth mindset? <laughs> okay, so I really love this because you're the first person to really challenge me on this, and I'm, I really want to have this discussion because I think it's so important, and 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 uh, healthy debate on these issues is really crucial. I guess it is a provocative part of the book, and maybe there's a bit of uh, uh, deliberate pro provocation here, but I do think we need to have a conversation. And the reason why I think we have to have a conversation is this. One of the things that, that troubles me a little bit about the growth mindset, and by the way, I'm not against growth. I think growth is absolutely fundamental to human development. But what I am against is the sense that we have to grow at all times. 
So you often hear uh, quotes like, you can't let your failures define you, you have to let your failures teach you or fail better, as you often hear sometimes in corporate speak. These, these mantras uh, sound noble, but when you actually dig into them, you find something that's quite unhuman. And I'm focusing on this first part of that quote, uh, this idea that you can't let your failures define you. Because what that tells us at some level is that there's something deeply shameful about dwelling in a state of failure. That, that somehow that sense of failure has to be immediately rehabilitated on the redemptive arc of growth or excellence or development. And that it can't be left alone to just sit for a moment, not touched, not rehabilitated, not changed, not suppressed, but just allowed to be, exist as it is, as a kind of humanizing, as I mentioned earlier, humanizing part of our existence, that that failure or setback or roadblock or thing that didn't turn out the way we expected it to turn out is just part and parcel of what it means to be a human. And so the reason why I wanted to push back a little bit on the growth mindset is that as a mindset, i.e. a mind that is set on one thing, that is growth, can be problematic when you string it out over time and only allow yourself to grow and not let in areas of life where you might stand still or you might regress and accept them as just kind of natural normal parts of our existence. So that is why I'm pushing back a little bit on the growth mindset because I think growth is fine, but sometimes we won't always grow and that's also fine. Okay, that's very reasonable. I, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, disagree with any of that. Um, so it sounds like you're, okay, so growth mindset as distinct from fixed mindset would be kind of how Carol Dweck would, would describe it. Growth mindset being like our abilities are not fixed and can grow. Fixed mindset, our abilities are fixed and therefore any failure is a uh, reduction of myself because like, oh, it shows that I'm stupid. It shows that I have no self-worth. Mm. So in that sense, kind of perfectionism falls into the quote fixed mindset thing. But I guess what, what you're saying is growth mindset, if taken too far, then could can also be problematic. Like exactly. any virtue taken to excess becomes a vice. Exactly. And there's always a balance here between self-improvement and self-acceptance. Exactly. And not everything needs to be converted into a kind of, here are eight lessons I learned on a Twitter thread um, for <laughs> from any kind of setback. Sometimes we can just be like accepting of a quote, failure and we can choose to reframe it as growth if we want, yep. or we can choose to be like, yep, that was a bad day at the office. Or if we're really enlightened, we can choose to, not, to accept it as part of the, you know, surrendering to the flow of life. Yeah. Um, but we shouldn't, it sounds like what you're saying is that we shouldn't feel as if we have to convert every single quote failure into some sort of lesson or some sort of growth opportunity. Yeah, Karen uh, uh, Horney, who uh, uh, was a psychotherapist who was probably one of the first to really delve into perfectionism in any great detail in the 30s, 40s and 50s, uh, talked about something called the tyranny of should. Uh, Ooh, and nice. that's in, that in this society we feel like we should be x y and z should be fitter stronger happier healthier more productive and these and these tyrannical shoulds are what create divides within us from the imperfect person we really are you know the person's flawed that makes mistakes that um will sometimes slip up to the perfect person that society tells us we should be you know strong fit healthy attractive intelligent whatever it might be productive whatever it might be and my worry with the growth mindset is, is that what we're doing is we're just kind of adding another should to a long list of other shoulds that we should be continually growing, developing, improving. And none of those things are problems. But I think Carl Rogers put it really well when he said, I am at my greatest, happiest, when I strive towards goals to which I am dimly aware. <laughs> And I think that's a really interesting way to look at life because yes, we will have goals. Yes, we will have this kind of ethereal vision in our minds about where we want to go. So we might want to be, you know, an, uh, you know, a, uh, a VP in our company. We might want to be a professor. We might want to be a YouTube influencer that has um, massive impact on vast waves of people. You know, we have this kind of idea and image where we want to go. And yes, you know, 
on the road there, it's important to have that kind of that kind of endpoint. But at the same time, to know that not always you're going to be not always is it going to be a case where you're going to grow all the time. Like you're going to hit sucks, you're going to hit roadblocks, you're going to go sideways, you're going to even regress sometimes because you what you thought you knew you didn't actually know. And all of these things are just as important as growth. You know, feeling like you're regressing isn't shameful. It isn't something to kind of quash or avoid or not talk about or not think about. It's actually just part and parcel of this kind of road to these goals that, you know, in the in your mind's eye, you have a sense that this is where you want to go. But, it, but you know, tying yourself and being fixed and having only kind of a sense that you you, you can only grow on that journey, I think is... For me, anyway, what's psychologically challenging and can turn itself into perfectionism if left unchecked. So, so this is what I'm. I guess this is the point I'm trying to get across to this idea that you know, growth, growth, growth is fine, but too much can be perfection. I love that. Yeah, the tyranny of should. I've been I've I've, I've been thinking about this a lot over the last few months. Like, whenever I find myself, uh, sort of giving myself a should i always kind of like hmm interesting like when when i tell myself oh i should go to the gym i sort of have grown now to recognize the should and really think hmm what's what's going on here and on one level i should go to the gym because it is good to be healthy and i value health as uh, you know all that crap but on another level it's a should and too many shoulds uh, lead to a shitty life as some people might say yeah so <laughs> that's really you- good Thank you. Uh, it's 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 not an original. I wish. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> um, do you? I I I have been unable to figure out like I you know I like things to fit into neat buckets and like I would love to be able to say telling yourself should is always a bad thing, uh, but clearly it's not. Clearly there's like a middle way. Um, have you have you got any thoughts on where is the middle ground between uh, should versus like not should? <laughs> if that makes sense. I'd add another tyranny in today's call. Oh, yeah. the, the tyranny of could. Um, because I think there's a tyranny of should, how we should look, but then there's always a tyranny of where we could be and what we could have and who we, and, you know, uh, particularly in a meritocratic culture like ours, we're told all the time that you could be this high. Or a high supposedly merit, uh, uh, meritocratic culture. Or a supposedly meritocratic yeah. <laughs> culture, yeah. Uh, one that valorizes meritocracy, but yeah, doesn't right. necessarily follow it through. Yeah. Um, but of course, like, but, you know, you're told, you, you could be this if you just try hard enough. So mm. not only are we, do we have these should, should coming at us from the bottom yep. to say this is how you should be, we also have these coulds from the top going and you can also be this person. We're kind of pincered um, in the middle. Uh, I think, you know, I don't think it's any coincidence that Karen Horney came to the conclusion at the end of her writing that kind of Zen Buddhism was the way forward. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> all roads lead to Zen Buddhism. Exactly. <laughs> she kind of ended there and this is kind of a big Im- influence on my thinking too because this kind of idea of letting go living in the moment being present and trying not to be overly impacted by the ways in which you're told you should behave and should look and all the rest of it and could be is the is by far and away the most fail-safe path to a contented life yeah uh but you know it's not easy there are practical things we can do I t- i've talked about some of them but it's not easy i just think uh, you know even just being aware that these things are pressing on us is the first step. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's my take. Um, I, I really like that thing you said as well around like being, being dimly aware of goals. Yeah. Um, I, like well, one thing that I'm kind of trying to att- attempting to make the case for, which is kind of annoying because it's actually hard to find evidence for this. Um, you know, the whole like smart goal stuff. Um, specific goals show uh, specific and challenging goals correlate with increased performance. That's right. Yeah. And that's kind of annoying because I've always been anti-specific and challenging goals in that I prefer my goals to be a bit more vague, pencil sketchy, and I prefer them not n- to, to not ideally be that challenging. And I prefer them to be within my control. Yeah. Like, oh, I vaguely want to make one YouTube video a week for the next two years and let's see what happens. And that was how I be- stayed consistent on YouTube for two years. Whereas everyone I know is like, I'm going to make X videos, which will hope where, where the specific measurable challenge and goal is 10,000 subscribers. Those people realize that failure after failure after failure, you can't control that outcome. So like you end up just burning out and giving up. Yeah. Whereas if it's a pencil sketch goal, that's not that challenging. That's fully within your control. That's a, that's a recipe for yeah, c- contentment at least. <laughs> well, do you know what? You'd be pleased to learn that actually new research is coming forward right now uh, to kind of 
challenge that idea of the specific goal framework um, and in particular champion, like you just said, more nebulous goals. Really? Goals, yeah, Incredible. Uh, Where I can put some of those into the book. <laughs> can you tell me more? <laughs> um, so, so a researcher called Christian Swan um, has done some work on goal setting. I can send you some papers, actually. It'd probably nice. be faster for you that way. Um, and they're just showing that, you know, it's not always about setting specific hard line goals that creates the maximum impact that actually, and this is in a sports setting because my background in sports psychology is what I know this research. Um, but that actually, you know, if you set yourself less clear, but nevertheless, you know, um, pointed goals. So, you know, like I say, these goals where you have an idea of you can, I want to, um, you know, win a race. It yeah. doesn't have to be like, this specific race on this specific day, but like over the course of a year, I, I want to win X amount of races. It doesn't matter where or when or why. It just matters that, you know, you have this kind of, this goal that kind of is pushing you in this direction, but nevertheless, it's not a kind of imperative that I must do this on this time. Yeah. Uh, and there's some really interesting uh, data that's coming through to suggest actually, you know, those types of goals are a lot more uh, for psychologically freeing and actually contribute to higher performance, interestingly enough, than the more specific goals. So I'll send you that research Sick. if you want. Uh, I can't speak in too much detail about it because it's not my area, but I think you might find it interesting. Yeah. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah, I think I think about like the, the name actually rings a bell. I think I've come across some of this stuff in my Zotero library when I've been l looking into this. But one, one phrase that like I really... And I, I, I haven't heard anyone else phrase it, phrase it this way, but I'm sure someone will have done way before me, is that goals are a destination. Oh, sorry, goals are a direction. They're not a destination. That's right. And setting a goal of like pencil sketching a rough direction means, okay, okay cool. I'm going to set on this journey and try my best to enjoy every step, of the, every step of the process. Because, you know, as Miley Cyrus would even say, it's it's the climb. It's not about, it's not about how fast I get there. It ain't about what's waiting on the other side. It's the climb. I think it's really important yeah. also to remember that it depends who's doing these things. So for some people, like rigid goals are not, not a bad thing. Like if you're conscientious and you make a list of things that you want to achieve, well, that is actually quite useful because it gives you a kind of roadmap that you can apply your energies towards. Yep. But if you're perfectionistic, you're not setting those strict and rigid goals because they're kind of a roadmap. You're setting them because they're managing your anxiety. They're like, I need to set these goals because if I don't set them and I don't meet them, then my anxiety is going to go through the roof. So this is kind of a way of managing anxiety that we're setting these goals. So I think, again, it goes back to where it comes from and the reason why we're setting these things in the first place. And if you're uh, especially perfectionistic, having rigid, firm, and what are often lofty goals is going to be really problematic because you may not meet them and you may not meet them for, you know, no good reason. Yeah. You could just have had a bad day. <laughs> you know, you could have woken up on the wrong side of the bed. A global pandemic could have come and shattered the the project that you were working on completely out of your control. For the perfectionist, that's really tough psychologically. For the conscientious person, it's not so bad. They set the goal, they move towards it, they didn't quite meet it, they can accept that. Yeah. So again, it just also depends on personalities too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, what, one of the mental models I use for this is sort of imagining like, lowering the bar and if you struggle with procrastination keep the bar as low as is humanly possible if you're struggling with consistency keep the bar really really low yeah. and by a low bar i mean a vaguely defined uh, not particularly lofty not particularly ambitious goal but then as you clear that bar you raise the bar slightly and then you raise it slightly and you raise it slightly exactly right. so for an olympic gymnast the bar of oh i'm just going to show up to practice whenever i feel like it is probably not that helpful they want to win which is fair enough yeah. But for someone who struggles to go to the gym, you know, setting a, a lofty goal of becoming Mr. Olympia is probably actually going to cause you to procrastinate rather than help you avoid that. And so kind of adjusting, adjusting the height of the bar, lowering, lowering it to make it vague and like not that lofty. Really exactly right and you t i tell this to my students all the time because lots of them like really struggle to start essays right because this is like a they see oh, it's a three thousand word essay this is really like oh my god i'm not going to do very well in this test it's a really hard topic i don't know about it ah so yeah. let's go on netflix um i just say just get just just write something write a letter to your mum like just get words on a on a on a on a computer screen and start the process it doesn't even have to be related to the task at hand because if you can start writing it's a nice note to your mum, but also it gets you in that kind of frame of mind where you're putting words on paper and then begin and then, you know, 
like you say, it doesn't have to be, uh, you don't even have to consult the literature, just put down your thoughts on this particular topic, right? And then begin to iterate, work those thoughts into some kind of structure, then bring in the literature and build it like, build it uh, from, you know, piece by piece. Um, because that is a way better way of smashing through the procrastination than going, everything has to be perfect right now on the first draft. And if it isn't, I can't possibly do it. Mm. So what you're saying there is a really, really helpful way for people to break through that procrastination. Cause I know procrastination is something that a lot of people struggle with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a, a, a quote from, uh, Cal Newport that I, that, that I love for this, which is, you know, he says that when he's right, when, when he's working on his books, he tells, he, he, he tells himself every time this one just needs to be reasonable. The next one is going to be good. Yeah. And so I'm trying to take that attitude towards everything in my life, whether it's book writing or like a gym workout or a YouTube video. This one just needs to be reasonable. The next one's going to be good. Yeah. <laughs> and I get to that one. It's like, this one just needs to be reasonable. And I think reasonable or good enough is, I think, the, the solution to a lot of the perfectionism, procrastination stuff that we deal with. And would you say like that's how you've built up this channel, right? Like, do you feel like it started? There was a lot of mistakes made at the beginning, and you can look back at it now and see the development. Is that is that how you've approached building up? Oh, absolutely. I wouldn't even consider them mistakes. I would just be like, yeah, it was good enough. Yeah. As long as and and my bar for a video is as long or a podcast episode is as long as this helps at least one person or has the potential to help at least one person. It's yeah. worth putting out there. Absolutely. That's a very low bar, and it's, that's yeah. still the bar. So you know, it's 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 nice to be able to have continued this for six years now. Great. Well, I mean, it's really nice to see that you've done really well. I mean, some of the numbers you get are incredible. So, yeah, and it's no, growing, right? It's good enough. <laughs> yeah, it's good. No, it's really, it's really, obviously it works. Whatever you're doing, it works. That's the one. Well, Thomas, thank you so much for coming on. This has no been problem. absolutely wonderful. Any final pieces of parting wisdom for those who might have gotten to the end of this episode who are still struggling with perfectionism? Uh, okay. Well, three words, I suppose. You are enough. And that is all that is what it is to be a human being you are a human being you exist so you are enough and i think that's the most important lesson to take through life something to remember all the time when things go well when things don't go quite so well it's okay you're human we fail you are enough beautiful thank you so much no worries all right, so that's it for this week's episode of Deep Dive. Thank you so much for watching or listening. All the links and resources that we mentioned in the podcast are going to be linked down in the video description or in the show notes, depending on where you're watching or listening to this. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, then do please leave us a review on the iTunes store. It really helps other people discover the podcast. Or if you're watching this in full HD or 4K on YouTube, then you can leave a comment down below and ask any questions or any insights or any thoughts about the episode. That would be awesome. And if you enjoyed this episode, you might like to check out this episode here as well, which links in with some of the stuff that we talked about in the episode. So thanks for watching. Uh, do hit the subscribe button if you aren't already, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.